Okay, howdy folks, Mark from Nomad Boat Building. We are back. We've got our backbone set up. Now let's just, uh, a reminder of what a backbone is on a boat. And it is usually the assembly of all the things along the center line. So in this case, it's our stem, our bottom, stern knee, you could also call it a stern post, and our transom. Those four elements connected together make up our backbone. If this was a different kind of construction, say a much larger boat, we would have a keel and keelson or hog as part of that construction. And the stem might be made up of several components. It might be made up of the stem proper, a forefoot or gripe or anchor piece. It might have what they call uh, also a stem apron on the inside. And those are all just terms that refer to different little bits and pieces. And we don't use them in every case. It depends on the specific design and the specific construction that uh, the builder has chosen to use. So we've got a laminated stem. We can do away with the anchor stock or anchor piece. Or, and the area we would call this would still be called the forefoot or the gripe. But it's not referring to a different part. It's just referring to a portion of our backbone. We've got our mold set up on our strong back. And my next job is to start installing rib bands. So I'm using what we refer to as a battented mold. And the reason for doing that is it's actually uh, intended to be a bit of a time saver. So if you're planking with very light planking and you try and bring it across a whole bunch of molds, what can happen is, is you can get oil canning between those molds if you don't have those planks just so. Uh, and it can be difficult, especially when it comes down to beveling the edges of those planks, it can be difficult to work on them because they're so light they want to flex out of the way. So whenever you do that, it's a good idea to have something that supports those plank edges, and that's one of the jobs the battens do. The other jobs the battens do is they're actually defining the shape of our planks. So each batten is being laid onto the molds at the same location as our plank lap. And by doing that, I can take my planking stock, lay it over the boat, and instead of spiling for it, which would be creating a pattern, we can basically trace it directly onto the plank. So we can bring a pencil to the inside of the, of the bottom here, and we can take a pencil to the bottom of this, this uh, batten or rib band, some people call them. And in doing so, we take our planking stock off and there's our plank shape described right on there. And we can just go right ahead and we can cut that. But there's another thing that that batten allows us to do. It allows us to leave one edge of that planking rough. So I can cut it, say, an eighth of an inch larger than that line or something like that. That means I only have to focus on getting one of my plank lines looking really good. I can put it up on the boat, I can glue it in place. And the way I deal with the other plank line, the rough edge, is we take a router with a, a template bit or a flush trim bit, and we just run that right on the face of the plank. The bearing on it follows the rib band and it cuts that plank down to that finished shape. So that's the savings right there, both not having to pre-shape that edge. And when you do shape it, the router's taking care of that job and it's following a rib band, which in theory should be relatively fair. The only downside to this little technique is as you approach the stem, the rib bands don't, they usually stop short. So you need to accommodate what's happening in here by some other means. So that's a bit of a trick. And I'm working through my head whether or not there's a way I can actually continue those rib bands right to the stem. I don't know if I can do that or not. Um, That'll be one of those things I'll sit here pondering for probably longer than it takes to actually just do it the, the, the harder way, which is just fudging in all those plank lines. But basically, we'll have our plank lines laid out on the stem, and when we get to here, we take a short batten and we connect the dots. And when we're running our router, we make darn sure that we stop when we get to this last frame and not go past it where the rib band ends and take a big chunk out of the plank. And guess how I learned about that? So using the rib bands, I mean, the way I was taught to do it, which was from Tom Hill's book on building ultralight canoes or ultralight boats. It's a great book and it got me started. So one of the things that um, he suggests doing is you, you scarf up your whole 
piece of planking stock, which is like a, a two by two by whatever the length of the boat is in terms of like two feet wide. And then he puts the whole piece of plywood over the side of the boat and traces inside and out. You take that off, you'll stack both pieces of plywood on. One of them's marked, the other one isn't. And you just cut out both at the same time, clean up those edges on both, hang them both. I, I guess it worked out okay, but I always found it a bit awkward wrapping that plywood around the boat and getting it clamped in place. So uh, what the, a technique I came up with that is similar to that, it's a little more wasteful on plywood, but I think it's easier to deal with, is you rip your plywood down into oversized widths. So say here, this, this finished plank width is probably like four inches or something like that, right? So I would rip my plywood, we'll say six inches. And I just take this short six inch piece, unscarfed, like the scarf might be cut on one end, but it's not glued together in one length. And I just take that short piece, lay it on here, scribe it both sides, cut it out, do the same with the next piece. And then I'm, I, I came to really enjoy scarfing right on the mold, you know, because I got two short pieces to juggle. I get them on, I get the scarves in the right position relative to each other. And there's a bit of a trick to that, but it's not hard. And then you glue it up in place and, uh, and then you move on to the next one. So I, I quite like that technique because I like working with the shorter pieces of material in this sort of congested shop. I find it easier, especially since I'm single-handed, and I'd rather cut these uh, planks I would on, say, the table saw or the band saw, which I can't do. If you're using the full sheets, you're stuck with basically a jigsaw, a circular saw, which is not quite as easy. The one part of using the battened mold technique is you need to remember to mark your next plank before gluing on your current plank, because you need both those battens exposed in order to trace them. If you go and glue one on and the next one isn't there, it's not the end of the world. You can trace along the bottom. You got to add a bit of your, your lap width to it, which is an annoyance, but you can recover from it easily enough. But the, the beauty is if you can remember to mark them ahead of time, you get this glued on. The next one is ready to go. While that glue is curing, you can take time to play around with cutting out those new planks and shaping those and getting them ready to go on the boat. Um, and, the, and the marking's already done, basically. So you're not, you're not trying to monkey around on the boat that's got a, a bunch of stuff clamped up on it. Now, of course, in order to hang rib bands on our mold, we need rib bands themselves. So I'm using the same pine that we made our molds out of. I believe this is lodge pole or ponderosa pine. I'm not sure which. It's 12 inches wide, four quarters thick. And normally I would use the jointing sled on my table saw to straighten one edge on this. However, the jointing sled is not long enough for these planks. So I'm gonna start by striking a string line on this plank, and then we're gonna use the table saw and we're gonna rip it freehand in order to get one reasonably straight edge. Now, while I'm demonstrating this technique, I am certainly not advocating that you try this technique. Freehand cutting on the table saw is arguably a dangerous activity to engage in. Now I'm very careful about how I do it and under what circumstances I do it. So I'll only ever do it when I'm cutting a thin amount off the edge of a plank. If I have to cut near the center of a plank, say if I'm cutting out a plank uh, shape, I will only do that when I'm using something that's very stable, like vertical grain, red cedar, when the planking is on the thinner side, say about half inch. I'm always worried about binding and kickback, of course, and so you need to be careful that you're not attempting this in situations where that is a higher risk. Now with a reasonably straight edge ripped on the table saw, we're just going to sweeten it up with a jointing plane over here on the planking bench. And you'll note that I did all of this work before the mold was set up. I always try and process as many materials as I can before I've got a boat in my way. You can see the lofting board is still in place at this stage of the game. Now, not to be a broken record, this is one of the reasons I do a full-size lofting whenever I can, because it gives you a preview as to all the parts you're going to need for the boat, and the sooner you have a really good idea of what those parts are, how big they are, what shape they are, you can process more stuff before the boat is actually set up. And that's an advantage in the long run. Now 
Now that my planks are jointed, I can rip them down to my finished widths on the table saw. Now normally I would thickness these planks down to my finished thickness before ripping, but because I am taking this down from a full inch thickness down to 5 eighths, that's an awful lot of planing that I prefer to not do. So I find it faster to take care of the ripping first. And I don't recall if I flipped these on their side and did a second ripping. Probably did so, that's what I would normally do. Or I might have just gone with thicknessing them down after they've been ripped to their finished width. In either case, dressing them down on the thickness planer afterwards just makes sure that everything is nice and consistent. Hanging these battens starts with me just throwing a stick up here onto the mold. And I've got my plank locations marked on the mold already. Uh, most of them are exactly just fine, but I am making some minor adjustments as I go. Now, attaching these to stem and transom is not a normal procedure. And the only reason I'm doing that, or I can do that, is because I've got a polymer nail gun. And uh, so they're basically little plastic nails they're just going to get buried in the transom. They're not going to come out. They're not going to affect it in any way. And this is going to be painted all over. So um, the fact that they're in there is not going to be a big deal. And the idea is that they'll break free fairly easily. They're, they're quite brittle. Uh, so their holding power is not fantastic. And they're only ever meant to be sort of supplemental to adhesives. So anyhow, my, my first job is to just pop these battens into place on the mold and uh, start fitting them to the ends. And I'm starting back here at the transom. I tell you, having your uh, flat bottom here, the dory bottom is darn useful for having some place to put your tools down. There, good. Good. So, of course, the jacks here, using these jacks instead of just clamping the baton itself, allows me to slide it back and forth, which is a convenience. Wouldn't be a terrible idea to have these guys with a little U in them. I, I have them as an L shape just by default because when I'm lining off things or fairing molds, it's a more convenient configuration for me. But um, I think this, I think a U shape might be useful to me as well. Now, let's see now, I want a little more length. We'll just leave it floating at the bow. I don't need it in place there. Okay, now down to the back end to fit that transom. Okay, so back here I'm laying my batten on in the general attitude that I want this to land. Now I'm just going to use the back of the transom as a guide. Of course, you got to keep this thing parked right where it's going to go, or else it's going to jam on you. I just need a rough angle. Once I have that, I'm going to slide it forward and then back into position and just check that I'm getting a reasonable fit. And um, that's good enough. I do not need a good fit on these. I, I'm just trying to butt these up to the transom so that it continues these plank lines all the way through. These connections are completely temporary and uh, the joinery I have here makes no difference whatsoever. So I just need a couple inches of tape and my method has been to uh, take a roll of tape, take a few inches off, attach it to my batten and then I take that piece of tape and I hang it on the side of my bench or somewhere else and at some point I knock it and I blow about six feet of tape in preparation for getting my next two inches of it. So it's a very efficient waste of tape. I highly recommend that technique. 
So once I've got some a uh, little bit of tape folded over the end, and that's just to make sure I don't get any uh, adhesive um, in here and glue this batten right to the right to the boat by accident. Clamp this in place. This in place and. There we go. So these are these polymer nails will come right through the, the face of the transom here, and it's not a problem. You just break them off. All right, with the batten tacked to the transom there, I'm just going to go along and use a nail gun to just isolate all of these rib bands in place, rib bands, battens, whatever you want to call them. And then the very first few of them, I just leave them the way they are with the uh, expectation once I fit them, fit the batten at the stem, uh, that it will, might affect the lay of that rib band a little bit. I keep, inter I keep using the word rib band and batten interchangeably. Keep that in mind. I mean the same thing. Okay, that looks pretty good. So now we'll just fit the stem. So up here at the bow, I line up my batten with my where my finished plank line needs to be. I just scribe a line on there. And now I just need to square off from the face of that stem, like so. The shape of this is such that it pretty much is sliding square into there. And then next I just take my, my miter square here and I pick up an angle off of the stem face. I lay that right here onto the batten. And the last thing I need is I need an angle across this way. Once I have that, I need to spring the batten out in order to mark it. So that's my cut line right there and right there. Just popping a leg up here to help brace the stick. We'll just check the fit. And that'll be fine. It's close enough. Stand to shave it down just a hair, I suppose. And now we just need some tape. Suppose I could just fold that tape over too, but it only takes a moment to cut a little dart in there. And again, we just try and swing it up into position and nail it off. Now there's a fair bit of twist in these guys, so nailing it off is not super easy. The hold these nails have is a little bit tenuous. I keep shifting down, which causes me to lock up. Much easier. See what one little finishing nail can do for you sometimes? Tape. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, you know, I don't have a tape dispenser for this packing tape, but I'm going to get one because I, uh, I took my other tape dispenser a while back and put a roll of packing tape onto it. It's the one that I use for masking tapes and stuff. 
And man, was it ever convenient having the packing tape on a, on a tape dispenser. And what was I doing? Something for this. I was thinking I was just wrapping molds or pattern this. Yeah, lam molds for laminating. And I was just amazed at how much faster it was to do that with a tape dispenser. It's a little something I'm gonna do. And one thing I'm doing is I'm trying to set these battens just a hair below the surface of the transom because there's always a chance that we might have to do a little bit more fairing out to get our planks to sit just so. I don't think we're gonna absolutely need to in this particular case, but this is just a matter of good practice to do so. Okay, need the business end of my hose. There we go. So that just means I've got a little bit of wiggle room before I start hitting the batten itself. Line that up. There we go. That looks pretty good. Yeah, maybe we'll let this spring out a little bit more. Okay, so uh, just a small detail here. Let's back up the camera. When we're building lap straight boats, or, or any boats really, I mean, there's a common practice to have planks taper from widest midships down to narrower at the ends. And part of the reason for that is usually the midships have got more space that needs taking up. In lap straight construction, uh, every now and then you get a situation where we have a transom that just has a little bit more acreage and is and trying to fit the same number of planks in back here is, and have them taper is not really possible. So it's not uncommon to have planks flaring out towards the transom. And when you do that, usually you try and make it happen as you get to the turn of the bilge here, or basically the turn of the transom. So you've got this cheek area here where your plank lines, you want them to look like they're from the side, that they're tapering down. But as soon as you turn the corner, if you look at it from the side, they're naturally going to look narrower because of the foreshortening that's take, taking place. You can use that to your advantage and you can actually even make the boat look better by starting to flare these out towards the back end so that when you look at it from the side, these seem a little bit wider. They don't feel like they're all sort of coming together into one little narrow area. It's just a small detail, but I thought it'd be one to point out. Um, so that's something that's happening right here where I, I'm, as I'm coming around the corner, I've had to sort of play around with these plank lines. And in fact, full disclosure, when I was designing this transom, I think I screwed up a little bit. I was designing to the outside of the plank. And I really, this was the one time I probably should have designed to the inside of the plank and I would have gotten more predictable results. Because as I got here, I suddenly realized, oh, wait a minute. All these plank lines I was working to are not quite correct. And um, and so I've got to think about how these planks overlap down here in a way that I that I hadn't quite uh, mentally worked out that geometry in terms of plank spacing. It's not a big deal. This is all going to work out just fine. And uh, you know, whatever you do on paper, it doesn't always work out exactly right in real life. And you got to sort of roll with the punches on that. And what that means for me is basically some of these plank lines back aft, I'm having to just sort of tweak them forward uh, by a, a little bit as we approach the, the midships area. It's not by much, mostly, mostly in this last, in the last station, I'm having to juggle them a bit more, maybe like up to three eighths of an inch from where they were. And, I'm, and as we get to the, towards the end, like two stations over, it's exactly where it should have been or where it was designed to be. See right here, this is sprung up and I think it needs to stay sprung up to look right. Yeah, we'll leave it sprung up. Now because my uh, battens are not necessarily landing right on my original marks, I'm just taking another batten here and I'm springing it up into place on the inside and just marking where the new location is so that I can carry that around to the other side of the boat and try and keep them all nice and symmetrical. It's really important for this particular planking method if you're going to 
cut both planks on one side to match the other to try and match up these batten locations. And do the same thing back here. Guess who's wishing he had two of these guns right now? <laughs> ah, but no need. We'll get along. We'll, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. Yeah, that'll work. And while I'm here, I just move my nails up to the next position. They aren't already there. Get rid of the belly rakers. Okay, I'm getting down to my last couple stringers here. And this is where things get particularly tricky. And the reason for that is this shape is suddenly coming into a hard tuck, which is something we pretty much never do in lap strike construction, uh, except in this style of boat, really. And um, so this is where I'm really getting into uncharted territory for myself. I've never tried to do this, and it's going to be interesting. So one thing I've been puzzling over is exactly how to run these battens through here. Because I'm planking from the keel down, these battens need to be oriented towards however this keel area works. And then the planks that come in here basically butt into them. So I'm probably gonna have to add like a strip of material on the inside to beef up this joint because it's not gonna have the full lap that we would have on any other joint here. And in fact, it's gonna go from having a proper lap up forward to having no lap back here. The lap's gonna peter out and we'll just have plank face and on this plank, this is the one which is gonna have a bevel on the lap instead. So that's definitely uh, quite different than normal. 
And so what I'm doing right now is I'm just working out how to lay this on here. It's got quite a bit of twist it has to take. And ultimately I want this plank edge to land right in here and sort of uh, jive with this particular joint right here. So I'm kind of working with that and trying to find the, rest, the best spot for it. It's right around here. And of course, because of the twist too, I can't really use, uh, the nail gun's not gonna do it for me. You gotta use some screws. So I'm just comparing it to the other side too, because bear in mind that I've gotta try and match these guys up. So another thing I'm doing is I'm not bothering bringing these right through to touch. Um, to do that just feels like it's going to be more trouble than it's worth. So I'm just going to let them float and I will, I'll be just making a point of fairing in this line through to this point while I'm doing my planking. So I think that's going to work out just fine. I'm not worried about that. So with just that one screw in there, that looks like that's going to jive up pretty good. I'm looking at, you know, where this corner right here lands, because that's going to be my plank edge, basically. And that's going to land just fine right there. And of course, when we're done, after we, we get some fairing to do, and I'm going to fair in all of this to match in here. So I've got another stringer to put on here. I'm going to follow this one all the way down to the bow and keep fastening on as I go. And this last one has got a lot of twist throughout, so I'm going to be using sort of 50-50 screws and uh, nails to get it to lay where I want it to. And one of the real advantages of using nails throughout this process rather than screws is I can actually adjust the position of these molds pretty easily just by giving these a good tap. Because these uh, little 18 gauge finishing nails or brads are actually pretty easy to bend around. Last stringer. So here's a trick you can use if you need to twist something into position, throw a clamp on there. It really helps if your tools are close at hand for it. I've already got my stringer position marked here.
Now, one thing I should say is I probably could have gotten away without battening this mold because the planking I'm using is quarter inch. It's got some decent stiffness to it, I think. But it seemed like a good idea regardless. Um, I don't regret doing this. What's kind of interesting though is thinking about how they built these originally um, when they're, they'd just be laying out the planking by eye. They might just say, okay, here's a board that's so wide we can get this much width out of it on this part of the boat. Uh, I'd love to try that. I'd love to try that. Okay, where'd my saw go? Yeah, that is a terrible fit. Doing fine, doing fine, doing fine, doing terrible. I keep losing my tape too. All right. You can tell I'm getting near the end of the day where every time I put something down, I forget where I put it and can't find it when I need it. It's a good way to finish out the day, I think, though, with a sense of accomplishment. Last stringer going on here. Move that guy. Let's get that on first. One thing you need to be careful of, if you have not beveled your molds, if you're going to screw something like this on, you got to be careful you aren't sucking this down to the face of the unbeveled mold, because that will start to make these lines unfair. So that's what happened to me just there. I went and sucked this down a little too tight and I could see this whole uh, rib band kind of suck in a little bit, get a little bit of a hollow. And so we just want just enough tension on that screw to hold it tight to this outboard corner, the touching corner. There we go. Done. I'm ready for beveling. That is a great way to wrap up the day. All right. Well, there you are, folks. We got all of our rib bands on the mold. Uh, that means we're ready to bevel the bottom and that means we're almost ready to start planking. I'm really happy with how this turned out. Um, now a couple of things sort of surprised me. I had to sort of tweak some of the plank shapes a little bit because of course whatever you come up with on paper doesn't always work out the way you want it to in real life and that's just fine. That's part of the process. Now I would personally like to have gone with slightly uh, fewer planks. I feel like there's a lot of narrow planks on here, which is not a bad thing. It's going to make for a much more rigid boat when we're done because each of these plank laps becomes like a little tiny stringer. And my client does want a really good robust boat. So from his perspective, that's good. Um, I just, for me, it's a, it seems a bit busy. And if I could have gotten away with one plank less, that would have been great. However, the template we were following was a bit etched in stone in terms of how many planks were on the boat. Now, when I did do up sort of a, um, one of the preliminary designs to this, I actually designed one with only five planks instead of seven. And that's because in that version, I had the garboards being one big plank on its own. And then I divided these ones up into uh, another single plank, I think, or just two instead of, there's there's two in this sort of flat part of the counter instead of three, which, which we have here. So um, I kind of like that version and maybe we'll build that down the road. Well, hard to say, but for now, we'll move ahead with this one. All right, that's it for today. Time for dinner. Get out of the house, do whatever your wife told you to do.